I'm Glenn Anderson with the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation. This TV series explores a variety of issues that relate to peace, social justice, and nonviolent social change. In recent years, American society has experienced a serious upsurge of anti-government rhetoric, including threats of violence against members of Congress, and in January 2011, an actual shooting. We've seen a continuation of war, torture and human rights abuses, cutbacks in vital social and health services. We've seen a mania for privatizing public services. We've seen intolerance of minority races and religions and an overall breakdown in the sense of our common humanity. Are these things interconnected? Do they have common roots? Can we find solutions that will resolve these problems and restore our public ethics and our common humanity. How can we reduce fear and violence and build a society that is secure and nonviolent? During this hour, we will explore these problems and we'll explore positive solutions. I'm happy to welcome two guests who will share their insights and their recommendations. Both guests are people I've known and respected for a good number of years, and I've always enjoyed working with them. It's a real delight to have on the program. Larry Kirshner and Becky Liebman. Welcome. Good to have you here. Thanks, Colin. Uh, they have rich backgrounds on a range of topics, and we will explore a range of topics and uh, reconnect and uh, meander through these things, and I think it'll be uh, interesting and, and fruitful. Let's start with uh, some aspect of privatization. Uh, the program, we want to explore the common good. It's in the title of this episode. In recent years, we've sh seen a shift away from the common good to a mania for privatizing a lot of aspects of public life. Instead of improving and supporting public schools, some people want to take money away from public schools and fund private charter schools. We've seen some states that have privatized their prisons, so instead of having state employees do it, who are well-trained and adequately paid, with decent health care and food, they privatize them, and then the companies that run those prisons cut food quality, cut <coughs> health care, and pay cheap wages to poorly trained uh, prison guards. Um, and even the U.S. military is contracting out some functions that U.S. troops have performed, and they've had organizations or corporations like Blackwater do them, even though they charge more than having the troops do it. But it's this mania that says, we've got to take money out of the, the, the government and fund private things instead. So I wonder, can you offer some insights into this mania for privatization uh, versus a commitment to the common good? It, it, a lot of it's based on the, the idea that somehow business and, through the market forces are better qualified to provide these kinds of services, but um, in fact, in fact, I mean, we can show lots of incidences where that, in fact, is not true. 
that the government um, run programs are much more efficient. If you look at healthcare, Medicare and the VA system have an overhead uh, cost to run the programs of about 3%, whereas the private insurance companies in this country have an overhead in the neighborhood of 30%. And that 30% that overhead, were it being run through a government um, sponsored program like Medicare for Everyone, could cover the 50 million people in this country who aren't currently have no insurance and no extra cost. So there are plenty of incidences where we can show that collectively through our representative government, we can do things more efficiently than the market because we don't require a profit. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, an example that comes to mind about, again, public good versus the, the private. Uh, it's been shown very clearly that if we want to conserve energy and meet our transportation needs, rail is by far the most efficient way to move people around, and yet we've been starving passenger rail services for decades. Uh, uh, the railroads back in the 60s were not making much, any profits on passenger rail. They were making their money from freight, and so they were just really doing a bad job of providing passenger rail. So Nixon and others created Amtrak, which is sort of a public-private kind of thing, but it's, it's always been starved. And, and light rail for urban transportation makes more sense. The subsidies go into uh, airports, and, which are inefficient in terms of travel for energy, you know, and the private automobile, which we know is horrendous. And so the, you know, the subsidies get get messed instead of looking at what's good for our own uh, energy conservation as a, as a whole nation. I think that if you look at what China is doing right now, um, they, the, where they're putting their money is in the, the light rail and, the, and the, the rail systems in their country because they realize that it's, if you've got a, a 1.3 billion people to move, mm -hmm. that's an efficient way to do it. Yeah. And mm -hmm. they were able to learn from our mistakes and just skip over that, yeah. that supposed uh, bit of progress. Yeah, and then there's one other thing that comes to mind. It's the um, nuclear power is horribly inefficient at producing energy, and if it were left to the market, uh, it wouldn't work. So the government says, well, well, we'll exempt you from liability, and private insurers will not insure you against a nuclear accident. So the homeowner or the individual citizen is just stuck with a liability, and, and the nuclear power plant is subsidized in that way by not having to have. So again, it's a, it's, it's, it's a benefit for the private profit rather than the public good. And you look at the elections now where the US Supreme Court decided in January of 2010 that giant corporations can just go ahead and buy elections. They can give as much as they want mm -hmm. uh, to election campaigns. And you know that clearly is a violation of the public good, but it's for private benefit. Mm -hmm. And uh, you just keep seeing these things all over, all over. Um, the day that before we taped this program, I happened to be downtown and I saw an employee in a local business sweeping the the doorstep, the the entryway to their small business, and. If I were doing it, you know, sweeping the litter, the, the dead leaves and the litter and whatever, if I were doing it, I would have swept them up, got a, a dust pan, and then brought it in and put it in the company's uh, garbage can. And said this employee, she just swept the stuff out and just left it on the public sidewalk that we all share. And I thought, well, this is kind of a metaphor for the program that, yeah. we're, <laughs> that we're producing Sounds now. Sounds exactly like it. And yes. we see that kind of thing where the, the waste gets dumped yeah. out at the public inconvenience. Yeah. And for the and for the selfish benefit of the business that just doesn't want to do uh, any accountability to the, the public, um, are there ways, just general principles that you can think of that that may help us sort out how to do public and private relationships? Well, I think one of the things the the, the market forces they base a lot of their what they say on Adam Smith and his theories of economics, mm -hmm. and what they. Um, a lot of them neglect is that the basis for Adam Smith's um, whole theories of economics, there was a moral basis for it. 
and there seems to be no moral ethic other than profit involved in the privatization efforts that we see today. The, the idea of common good isn't considered a value to deal to, mm -hmm. it shouldn't enter in because it doesn't show a bottom line profit. But if they were truly following the dictates of Adam Smith, there would, that would be entered into the, uh, the overall pr progress, uh, the idea that there is a moral in, uh, aspect to it that they're ignoring. <clears throat> and the conversation becomes very encumbered right now because um, there's a very um, visceral reaction, anti-government reaction in the land or anti-government feeling in the land. And so to your question, Glenn, is there a way that this could begin to, that we could back up and take another look? Um, it would be wonderful if uh, it would begin to sink into the public consciousness, just what government does do for us. We, mm -hmm. we take these services so for granted. But for example, folks have pointed out, uh, I set my alarm clock at 6.30, uh, I hear the, the radio station and I can hear the stations because the FCC has, has made it so stations won't overlap. I uh, go to my faucet to make my coffee. My, my water is potable because the government has, um, has provided for that. I, I flick on my switch to make the coffee and uh, my house doesn't burn down from an electrical short because uh, an electrician that was monitored by government did good work. Mm -hmm. And in the Pacific Northwest, I'm the beneficiary of hydroelectric power that was government mm -hmm. subsidized. I get in my car and I, you see where this is going. I'll yeah, just rattle yes. off a couple more, but yeah. you know, stop at a stop sign or stoplight, which has, okay. has been engineered for my safety thanks to government. I, I go through my day, I, I, uh, I'm able to walk on the sidewalk without a bunch of dog poop because <laughs> government yeah. has figured out, let's get the dog poop. Not a, or I, I go for a run in a city park to yeah. relax. So, so uh, I think if people could begin to um, just have some honest uh, recognition of the extent to which we are able to lead our lives because of government. Yeah. And it can be a little misleading in that oftentimes in our world, we pay money for something. I pay money for my groceries, I get my groceries. In the, in the um, in terms of paying for government services, we pay, but we don't get that tangible thing it immediately. Directly. So it's, it's easy to discount Yeah, you that. don't pay it right there. You know, your, the sales tax is sort of identified with whatever it is that you bought, or your property taxes, if you're a homeowner, those get collected twice a year, but you don't see it directly as going into that stoplight that kept yeah. you safe, or the, 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 the National Weather Service that told you a storm was coming. Exactly. You know, because we're not doing a direct fee for service, for each of those things exactly. is done in a, in a smoother, more efficient way, so you don't need to mess with it. You don't need a, to pay a nickel every time you go another block on the city street. Well, here's the toll booth for the next block. Here's the toll booth for the next block. You know, we, it's, it's I think hidden. The, I think the people that are provoking the anger against the government don't want to talk about those kind of things. They, I think a lot of the anger in this country has came about or coalesced around when the government bailed out the banks and all the people were losing their houses. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, the, it's, a, it's a clear example of the people on the top benefiting at the expense of yeah. the people on the bottom. And I think a lot of the anger came out of that. And then the, the politicians who see it to their benefit to stoke that anger, mm -hmm. they've added on other things, healthcare and other, yeah. through good propaganda but I think there was, there was a legitimate anger among the people that was there to begin with that has been used by those mm -hmm. politicians. Yeah, and we'll look at some of this, um, uh, the, some of these things that are legitimate reasons for anger or legitimate reasons for fear. I mean, some of that is legitimate and, and cuts across the whole political spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's helpful to sort out which of these things are valid versus which are not right. valid. Exactly. And, and what are the real problems and what are the real remedies? And it's, it, uh, to, to lump everything together simplistically uh, is, is unhealthy. I, I'm aware of this quotation from uh, Grover Norquist, who uh, works with a very conservative anti-tax organization in Washington, D.C., and he was famously quoted as saying, my goal is to cut government in half in 25 years to get it down to the size where we can drown it in a bathtub. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Well, so when he does that, then what happens if your house catches on fire? There's no fire department. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, if you come to that intersection, there's no stop sign. You're going to go for the lowest bid for the fire departments, yeah, the yeah. private fire departments. Right, yeah. yeah. And, and I, so I think that the, the, the anti-tax uh, rhetoric is, is very simplistic, but sorting out the legitimate reasons for concern, yeah. uh, we, we need to do that, and we'll do that on the, on the program here. Um, the, the, and, and some parts of the government are, are good, and then there are some parts that are abusive. Exactly. And there are exactly. parts of the government that are torturing people. This, mm -hmm. this government yeah. is corrupt in a lot of ways. There's 26 yeah. lobbyists in Washington, D.C. for every member of Congress. Yeah. I mean, yeah. how can the, the little person right. compete against that? And, and the health care legislation that went through the Senate was actually drafted by somebody who was high up in an insurance company. Right. They drafted it for uh, Senator Max Baucus from Montana, who was running the Senate Finance Committee. Right. And there's a good reason to be concerned when the health insurance company uh, big shot is drafting the health insurance legislation, yeah. and so we want to, you know, that stuff needs to get sorted out too. Mm -hmm. There's some good parts of the bill, but there are some really bad parts of the bill. So we need to sort sort this out. It, it, but it, it's helpful in in doing better quality thinking. And uh, it, the uh, George Lakoff, who's done this really good thinking and work about framing and reframing issues, it would be helpful to use his insights to help people sort out mm -hmm. what what's working. Uh, you've talked about uh, taxes. There's mm -hmm. another thing that people ran Well, about. yes, in terms of um, framing, I, I enjoyed the quote by Oliver Wendell Holmes, who said, I like paying taxes. With them, I buy civilization. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I and believe there's a lot of truth to that. That's right. I mean, that's the, the dues that we pay for living in a civilized mm -hmm. society, mm -hmm. and yet they talk about the, quote, tax burden. And when they frame it that way, well, tax burden, well, that's, that's a weight that's holding you down, and they talk about tax relief, which means you've been burdened and now you're going to be set free. Well, that frames the debate in a way that, that goes against these valid notions of mm -hmm. government that we were talking mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. So why can't we talk about taxes in the ways that you yeah. said? Uh, what else do we have uh, uh, that, that would help our thinking about Well, I think taxes? one of the problems is thinking. People, people in this country are not educated I read a, uh, something recently that said that 37% of college graduates in this country don't know how to do critical analysis. Mm -hmm. These are college graduates. Mm -hmm. um, almost 50% of high school graduates don't know mm -hmm. how to do critical analysis. Mm -hmm. So when people who are living in a state of anxiety, um, they see things kind of bad around it. 100 million people in this country are, have a, a poorer financial condition than their parents did. When they see that kind of thing around them, they believe what they're told about the reasons for it instead of f getting information and thinking yeah. a, a clear analysis of it. They just believe what they're told. Yeah. So I think that's part of the problem is they don't think about it. And I think that's, to a large part, what we need to do is educate people and get people thinking mm -hmm not correctly, but thinking, period. Yeah. Well, part, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, and, and, and part of the way to do that, I believe, is to uh, not feel like we have to have the answers all the time. No, not we don't. Feel, um, we don't have the answers. Yeah. I think, I think getting people to think about it, the answers will develop out of the yeah. people. Right. Yeah. right. I, I, I just wanted to, to weave in here. My mother, who's 89, said to me the other day, I think we need to practice saying, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And she said, she who walks with a walker, she said, I, I practice that in my bathroom mirror. I look in my <laughs> bathroom mirror and I try all the different ways I can say, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, I don't know. It would, it would <laughs> ratchet things down because uh -huh. I do it myself if, if I'm on um, thin ice, if I don't know my facts and figures, uh -huh. but I might cling to my uh -huh. assertion, even if it's, under, if it's not girded, and I might cling to it with some uh, fierceness, but if it was, if I lived in a culture where it was more um, easily accepted for me to say, boy, I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm a retired family nurse practitioner, and I used to tell my patients that the advantage I had over physicians was I could say I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think one of, the, one of the ways that it helps also is if we can help people get back to our values. Mm -hmm. If we get back to, okay, let's, 
you know, I, I value fairness. So uh, I might not know the technical answer, but I know my yeah. root values yeah. include fairness. And so can we devise a solution that will be fair to everybody? So like on taxes, part of the thing that people are angry about is some people don't pay their fair share. Rich people in our society and big corporations do not pay their fair share. Many of the big corporations pay absolutely zero taxes, mm -hmm. and some of them pay zero taxes, and they've got enough tax credits, they actually get money paid back to them so that ordinary middle class and working class and poor people are subsidizing multi-billion dollar corporations. And people know that's not fair. So let's get back to the issues of fairness right. and talk about what will be fair. You know. So wouldn't that be a good conversation to have when people are concerned about taxes? If you look, I'll bet we would find a lot of common ground. I, you're right. If we could look at the tax structure post-World War II, there was about a 30-year period there in which the middle class in this country grew at its fastest rate. Right. The tax was progressive. The people who made a lot paid a lot. Yeah. When it got to, to Ronald Reagan, who said government is the problem, and the tax rates started going down, that's when the deficits started going up yeah. in a lot of these things. But if we had a true progressive income tax in this country and we were not wasting our treasure on imperialist militarism, mm -hmm. we have all the, all the wealth in this country we right. need. We just, it's just a matter of priority to, to yeah. answer the questions. Yeah. And on your issue of wealth, I believe that the people who have made the most money off our system have the greatest responsibility exactly. to pay for the exactly. system that made them rich. That's the moral so, part that yeah. Adam Smith talked about. So I would, if I were having a conversation with somebody with a different political label than I might have, I'd get down to the issue of values and talk about fairness mm -hmm. and that sense of proportionality. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so that's, I, I think it, we can do that. It's not a, it's not a complex question when you talk about things like fairness and, and um, equal treatment right. and respect for one another. I mean, those are not difficult things to, to uh, yeah. figure out. On, on this program, we want to talk about the common good. And one, I think, essential step toward achieving the common good would be to help people develop some sense of empathy. And I think mm -hmm. part of that is what, what's lacking in our society, where people think only of themselves. I'm not saying everybody, mm -hmm. but there's a tendency in the society to like in the 1980s when it was like uh, looking up for number one, you know, exactly. I have to make me big at your expense. Right. And if we could cultivate empathy so I could recognize, oh, well, we share a common humanity. Mm -hmm. um, I need to make sure that you get your needs met and I get my needs met and then we can all thrive yeah. together. Uh, and people all over the world um, are, are, think about this and talk about this. And I'm reminded of the the concept of Ubuntu, Ubuntu, uh, which is a word from the Bantu language, and it's um, a philosophy that's recognized in many, many cultures in the southern part of Africa. And basically, it means um, my humanity is bound with your humanity. Mm -hmm. And not only is this something that's um, kind of lived and breathed in some cultures, or the, the the, the philosophy of it, whether or not it's embodied all the time, people mm -hmm. are people, right? But, right. Um, but it is somewhat codified in the new South African constitution. Mm -hmm. It is, uh, there's a whole Linux operating system called Ubuntu. Um, the, the Boston Celtics chant Ubuntu when they come out of their huddle because they believe that they're building some kind of, um, you know, our humanity is hooked up with each right. other, our playing is yeah. hooked up with each other. So um, it's something that is in, in the human heart. It's under the yeah. human skin. We, we come, many people have come to this same yeah. uh, draw that this is, this is there and we believe it. Yeah, when you told me about that, I, I, I researched some and I found that it, it appears in many of the languages yeah. in the southern part of yeah. Africa, the same concept, and it might be spelled a bit differently or pronounced a bit differently, but it's, and it's defined, and Nelson Mandela has talked about it, and Desmond Tutu right. has talked about it, and, I mean, it, the, 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 the notion that yeah. says if, um, if, if, if I'm going to really be a, a real person, I have to make sure that you're fulfilled as a right, person as right. well and that the whole community is. I mean, that's, it's, it's sort of the roots of that saying that it says it takes a village to raise a child. It's, yeah, it's, it's, I think it, it goes along with, uh, if you look at what uh, Jesus and Martin Luther King both said, the way you judge a society is how you treat the, 
yeah. the least yes. among you. Yes. I mean, yes. the, the poor people in this country, how do we treat them? Yeah. That, and, and that's how American society should be judged. And if we're not treating the least among us well, which we're not, uh -huh. we need to look at why we're why we are the way we are. And it has some implications. Uh, when, you, when you and I were preparing for the mm -hmm. phone, you mentioned a doctor who's in Seattle, actually, he teaches in Seattle, and he, he has done extensive research showing that the health of a whole society is harmed when there's inequality. Right. Um, and so here's a uh, graph showing like the top 30 countries in the world in terms of life expectancy and uh, Japan here at the highest above 82 years um, has the highest life expectancy and the United States is now 29th uh, we're behind Cuba and uh, behind a bunch of other countries and and th his this doctor uh, said it's not because uh, like we have such a good healthcare system. We have the most expensive healthcare system in the world. And in Japan, they have a very high rate of smoking, but the, but the United States has a much higher rate of death by lung cancer because, partly because our, our healthcare system is focused on profit instead of on health, and partly because we have such a gap. And this is his main point, is right. there's this gap between the rich and the poor. Um, there's also this graph, which I don't expect you to read, but I just want to show the main features. This is uh, the gap between the top one hundredth of one percent of U.S. families um, in relation to the average income of the bottom ninety percent of U.S. families. So you'll see a gigantic peak right here, and that was in the late twenties, right before the stock market crash and the Great Depression, and you'll see over here that we are reaching these kinds of peaks again now in our economy where there's this enormous disparity between the very, very rich mm -hmm. and everybody else. And we're seeing that where um, that has actual effects in terms of life expectancy mm -hmm. from the first graph. And other indicators. He's this same doctor has yeah, done. Stephen, Stephen uh, Bur Burj, yeah, Stephen Yeah, he's done. He's, he's taken a number of indicators of life expectancy and infant mortality and various kinds of health indicators and and the composite ranking of all those versus income disparity right. on a nation by nation basis right. is just striking. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the United States has horrible income disparities compared to other countries. And we have really horrible health statistics compared to other countries. Don't, don't we have the largest disparity now yeah. of any country of, in the of, world? Of any, at least of, of any the, the major the, countries. Of any of the country. well-to-do countries, right. yeah. 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 And we have all these horrible social problems, and it's because of that we, we think about my wealth and to heck with you, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and so. <clears throat> I want to pick up. Um, uh, a related theme about sort of the common good and thing. There was something you had mentioned on the phone, Larry, and, and, uh, and public space. You know, a, a society, you think of the old Greek agora, the old Greek marketplace where people would gather and talk politics and talk philosophy and it's a meeting place. And we have a, kind of a shortage of public space where people can gather and have human to human interaction. Right. You can see a few small spaces like Traditions Cafe in, in Olympia. Yeah. But if you're looking at a space for more than you know, 50 people, it's mm. difficult to find that. And, and what, what came to mind when we were talking was um, the weekend before the Seahawks had, had had a playoff game in Seattle where, I don't know, there were 60,000 people in a public space, and that was for profit. They probably didn't have to get a license to have those 60,000 people there. But when WTO went on in, in 1999, um, there were probably all kinds of licenses that were required and probably ignored to some extent by the people. But and, there were 40, and tear gassing of innocent people. And there people. were 40,000 people yeah. there who, when they didn't do what they were expected to do, were tear gassed yeah. and clubbed. And, yeah. um, so it, so the, the little bit of commons uh, of public space that's there, 
the powers that be want to regulate closely. Right. Well, and a lot of the public space that people have now where people gather are at malls right. or other private places. And That's you private can't, property and they'll you kick you out. You don't yeah. have a First Amendment yeah, right. Yeah, you don't. The Constitution no, is suspended exactly. in, in malls. <laughs> so where do you have... It's, const it's, you know. it's not there for people, but it's there for the corporations. Oh, yeah. They have, they have a, all the First Amendment right they want. Well, and, and after the... Or the, they can buy. Yeah, after <laughs> the, the, uh, the January 2010 Supreme Court ruling in Citizens yeah. United... Right. The, the this right wing court said uh, that they can spend as much as they want on on election campaigns, uh, and and so that's again an abuse of the private versus what should be the the public good. Right, and the law and the illogic of that obviously is that they consider corporations to be persons, mm -hmm. and there's some movement among people to to have a persons defined as a naturally born yeah, person, yeah, an actual so, human being, so yeah. an actual human being. <laughs> And thus, corporations would not have right. those rights. Right. And there's, a, uh, there's something we touched upon a few minutes back having to do with uh, people's uh, angers and fears and stuff and, and the wealth and non-wealth that we experience. And I know that, that in the United States, income levels in terms of real dollars when you factor out inflation peak in about 1976 or 1977, depending on which data you look at. And people know that they, and you had mentioned that, that like 100 million people are less well off right. financially than their parents were. People know that they're on this slide downward and whether they articulate it with numerical research or whether it's a gut feel that says we're going the wrong way, you see more and more uh, public opinion polls where larger portions of the public say our country's headed in the wrong direction. And people know that um, yeah. a lot of indicators are getting worse in terms of some environmental things and sprawl of, you know, there, economic. There was a Rasmussen poll that came out um, late last year. It said that only 36 percent of the people in this country expect that it's going to get better in the future. Uh -huh. I mean, that's a yeah. that's a wow. staggering so, so, number. Wow. So what that does then is is if you're feeling kind of hemmed in and you're on this downward slide, you go into this defensive mode and you can go, I want to take care of me and my exactly. family and we're going to jettison you and your family. Right. And so you get this polarization of us versus them and the bitterness about, well, my race or my religion or my whatever versus yours. And so you can understand people's fears, but the, the danger is when they get exploited by somebody who exactly. says right. uh, you should be afraid of those people exactly. of a different race exactly. or the different religion exactly. or whatever. And that's exactly. what's, I, I see that's what's happening is exactly. people with those racist or bigoted agendas are exploiting right. what are in some cases very natural fears. Let's look at the real reasons right. why we're having economic problems. Let's look at the real reasons right. why we're having environmental problems yeah. and go after those. Right. Yeah, yeah the, the whole anti-immigrant movement is, yeah. is a prime example yeah. of that. They're, they're afraid that these immigrants are gonna come and take our, our jobs <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. and are gonna work for less money, but in fact, the corporations have already moved those jobs yeah, offshore. Yeah, nobody for has those jobs. For people who work for yeah. 25 cents an hour. Right, right. So it's, it, but these people are, right. these people who are anti-immigrant are being controlled by that hate and that fear. Right, right. So. So let, given all that we've said thus far about our concern for the common good and what some of the pitfalls are in trying to get there because of obstacles and things, let's look. Uh, a bit differently at the other half of the program title here that tonight's uh, that this program's title is the nonviolent society for the common good so let's look at issues of violence and nonviolence some of the things that we've talked about are construed by thoughtful folks as institutional violence or systemic violence when you have an unjust economic system that's doing violence to those on the bottom if you're abusing the environment you're doing violence to the environment or and the, to the people who need that water or air or whatever. So let's look at some of these uh, systemic or institutional things. Other, uh, do you have other insights about violence or nonviolence that we should be sharing at this point? And then we'll get into. Well, the whole prison industrial system is a prime example of that. If you look at the there's two and a quarter, two and a half million people in prison in this country, which is 25% of the, 
of all the people in the whole world who are in prison. Mm -hmm. And more than 50% of them have skin of black or brown in a country where they only make up about 15% of the population. So that tells you that the people of color and the poor people are the ones that are in the prison. Uh, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's a prime example of the injustice yeah. of the system, which is a form of violence against poor people uh -huh. in this country. There, there's this notion that we see in movies, and we see it in our foreign policy as well, in movies, a Western or a crime movie or a spy movie, you get right up toward the end of the film and there's a big shootout. And that shootout just resolves all the problems. Yep. And, and, and so all those problems are resolved because of that big shootout right before the movie ends and then it can end on a happy note. And this has been referred to as the myth of redemptive violence, right. that, that violence can solve the problems and, and redeem us from, from them. And this is pretty much embedded in the, our culture and we play this out in our foreign policy so that if we have a conflict with some other nation, the remedy is, well, let's go bomb them. Let's, let's you know, do this or that or whatever kinds of things. And there's this old saying that says you have to fight fire with fire, but that doesn't work. you got to fight fire with water. Exactly. And we don't do that. <laughs> and um, so we, we, we see that played out. And, and I think that's worth mentioning in this context, that, that we have to change that whole paradigm. We have to change that whole model of how we see the world. It's clear that... Um violent solutions to problems create violent problems that then need to be dealt with again. Right. Whereas, because in a violent solution to a problem, you've got someone who's going to be angry, whatever it is. Uh -huh. There's going to be an angry person, and that person will have learned to resort to violence because from their problem. Yeah. Whereas if you, if you solve problems nonviolently, there's not that angry person there right. to continue that, that flood of violence. Yeah. Well, Becky is part of the solution. You do a lot of volunteer work with uh, the Dispute Resolution Center of Thurston County, right. and the whole notion of, of conflict mediation right. is a way to get out of that and do a different model where yeah. people are empowered. It, 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 is such a, um, it is such a hopeful field. It's, a, it's really a relatively young field, the, the field of co alternative conflict resolution. I would say it's 30 or 40 years old, and how it, one way that it manifests here locally is through our local dispute resolution center, and that is very much a case of um, both the earlier part of this, the theme of the, of the earlier part of this program and what we're talking about now. In that, it is a, a blatant situation where others can help where. where the community can help individuals resolve their conflicts, where mm -hmm. the community, as, as represented by a, a couple of very highly trained mm -hmm. volunteer mediators, can help individuals in conflict, which is so normal. It's, it's a completely normal part of our world. Mm -hmm. But when you're in it, you don't know how to get out of it. Mm -hmm. And so this is definitely an example of where the, uh, the community uh, represents the public good, being able to help the individual grow and thrive. Well, I, I like it so much because it actually empowers people to practice oh, yeah. empowerment. And, and having been through that, then people can say, oh, okay, well, I, can, I have some new sense of how to, to move towards solutions, or it's, it's like practicing democracy. You know, we don't all have to have <laughs> the same... All. Well, in, in a democracy, you don't have to have the same political viewpoints. Not at all. But if, if somebody has a different political viewpoint, you don't beat the crap out of them. Right. You, oh. you interact and you work it through and Gandhi always believed that everybody has a part of the truth and you bring it together and right. certainly in the mediation there's process. There's many truths, there's many truths. And yes, this, this happens to be uh, one approach of dozens and dozens of approaches to conflict resolution, but um, it is, it presupposes that people don't like each other, they don't trust each other, yeah. um, they don't want to be in the same room with each other, but 
uh, through a, a very pretty common sense blending of, I would I call it communication 101 and psychology 101, mm -hmm. really a, a little formula, yeah. a little approach, a little set of tools uh -huh. can truly help people walk yeah. out of the room with some solutions, right. their we, own solutions. Right, yeah, yes. And they have a much higher rate of compliance, yeah. as I exactly. understand, than there. something that's imposed by a court exactly. because the people have worked this out themselves. Yeah. Well, they've empowered, been yeah. empowered to solve their problems. Yeah. What, a, what a concept. Yeah. You know, this is what we need in a democracy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what if we collectively use that formula for a foreign policy? Wouldn't that be a switch? That, <laughs> I mean, that's a whole different model than bombing the crap out of somebody. We, we, the government is sometime in the near future going to start talks with Iran again. Yeah. And we've basically threatened them with, with mm -hmm. violence if they don't agree to every yeah. demand. Yeah. You have to do if, what we say or we'll beat the crap out of it. Exactly. Yeah. What if we went and yeah. found common agreements yeah. and, because surely there are things that we agree on. Well, and if, that, if that was the, yeah. the entree. Right. And, and, and it takes a finessed process, like um, a, a rudimentary nutshell um, description of conflict resolution is, let's say there's two people and they both need the orange, an orange. Oh, yes. And, um, and so if we had to compromise, if, if we're not going to bomb one person right. or another, and we had yeah. to compromise, okay, let's cut the orange in half. But it turns out um, that was still unsatisfying to each party because one party needed the juice of an orange, and a whole orange, and one party needed the peel right. of they're, a whole they're orange. Right, they're going to be making bread and it's orange sure, peel yeah. and the ingredients. But you wouldn't know that unless you were able to just kind of get talk, in there and be able about to... Talk what your interests What are. the needs are and the interests, yeah. 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 And... and you know, we, we've been through, in the previous administration in this country, this unilateral thing where mm -hmm. we would just snub, deliberately exactly. snub the United Nations and deliberately violate international law and say, no, we're going to just do it our way and with contempt of get a, and violate the Kyoto Protocol for the climate and all that stuff. It's embarrassing. And we've got to turn these things around because the rest of the world knows that, that that's just bullying. Right. It's just exactly. bullying and that doesn't get respect. And... and when people have been bullied, they're going to want to get back at the bully in one way or another. And we're seeing other countries that are wanting to get back at the United States. And, and I think we need to understand it. So it's, it's like when we were talking about the anger that people in this country have if they've been ripped off by an unfair tax system or they've been snubbed by politicians that don't represent them because they've been bought by a higher power, a <laughs> higher financial power. I don't mean right. <laughs> <laughs> but. <laughs> but uh, but uh, um, we see that in the first half of the program where there are reasons for anger and there are reasons for yeah. this, and we see this in the international sphere too. Yeah. And and we've got to you know work it. It, it, it doesn't take have a the global genius common to good. recognize that words and actions have implications. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, it shouldn't be that hard to figure it out. I, I want to <laughs> show something here that sort of illustrates this, and I realize the viewers won't be able to read the fine print. But we, we have this notion of national security, and we usually think of this as we got to have the most weapons and be willing to use them and bomb people and bully them and uh, ignore international law and do things our way and insist, demand on getting our way. And that's sort of the, the usual, typical American way of getting national security. And um, it's based on domination. Each row here is a different aspect of this where... It's based on domination, and we blame an axis of evil. You know, Bush identified Iraq, Iran, and North Korea as an axis of evil, even though they're not the least bit allies. Um, and and uh, the, the other column off on the right side is a better way to really get true security. If we really want to be secure, instead of trying to dominate, we would cooperate. Uh, and, and make friends with other countries and collaborate, work together for common solutions. Uh, Martin Luther King never called any person evil, mm -hmm. like Bush named this accessibly evil. Martin Luther King identified three evils that were not persons. He identified racism, militarism, and poverty mm -hmm. as things that we have to fight against. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a whole different thing from blaming people. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the goals, instead of national security against other nations, would be global security with other nations so that we're all sharing this Ubuntu concept, you know, we can only be secure when we make other countries secure and respect their integrity. Um, and so the, and 
you know, so it's it's just a, a whole different model, right. and it plays the, down the page in, well, in that way. What would way. the world be like if the seventeen trillion dollars we spent on nuclear weapons? had been used to give clean water to everybody yeah. on the earth. And I've seen breakouts of, of how much we spend on militarism and how little it would cost to like provide clean drinking water for everybody on the planet yeah. and right. take care of the, the, the desert creating droughts that are happening across it's, some it's areas. It's just a matter of priorities. And, but but it's, it comes from the selfishness and we, we just need to get, get beyond that. Um, I remember, um, Martin Luther King had said, a true revolution of values will lay hand on the world order and say about war, this way of settling differences is not just. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. And you can just see what's happening to our country, mm -hmm. the kinds of problems we're talking about, when we um, keep going down that, that divisive path uh, instead of Instead of this, um, are there? Let's see. I want to get on to this next thing here. You've done some really um, clever and varied work that I keep. When we're talking about the topics to prepare for the program, it seemed like a lot of these were about empowering people and depolarizing. We've talked a lot about the polarization. And you've done a lot of things that bring together people in various ways, including music. Tell us oh, some of those you. fresh ways. Well, I just feel very deeply, very passionately that uh, music and movement together in community is uh, a very underutilized way to break down isolation and to very quickly find a common denominator. I'm in a, a community concert band, and I'm sure among the 55 of us, um, we represent the entire spectrum in terms of um, uh, how we view the military, how we view religion, how we view politics, but we are there on the same page in the same <laughs> measure, hopefully, <laughs> with each other. And, um, and actually, I think it was just in our local paper, but it's been around for a while, that uh, this understanding that it makes you happy. <laughs> mm -hmm. It makes you happy. And there's a lot of really um, fascinating speculation about how music and movement may have fit into human evolution and the evolution of mm -hmm. communities. So um, that is not the most uh, resoundingly political strategy to make uh -huh. the world a better place, but I think it is um, a, a, worthy, mm -hmm. a worthy strategy. Mm -hmm. I think it is political in the sense of the, the original word, you know, has to do with the populace, the polis, the, the people. Thank you. And, and that works. I heard someone today talking about, after listening to Cornell West expound on some of these issues, and they said, this after listening to him, that that's another thing that's missing in, in our everyday language is poetry. People don't mm -hmm. talk that way anymore. Everything is, mm -hmm. is cut and dry. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no, there's no <laughs> passion mm -hmm. along those lines. Yeah, and you do great poetry. I've enjoyed a lot of your poetry, and I look forward to reading more. But so yeah, and one of the things that you that you do with the Artesian Rumble Orchestra mm -hmm. is you come out and support the mm -hmm. Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation's well, vigil yeah. Friday, four thirty at uh, uh, Percival Landing downtown. You come out. We start the vigil at four thirty. The band comes out at five. They play till six, mm -hmm. and we have a wonderful time. And it creates a festive yeah. thing. You know, well, our our approach to working for peace is is um, is a positive approach. It's not this angry blaming kind of thing and it's it's a positive the kind of attitude that we're conveying right. on the program right. here and and the music that you do is lively and fun and passers-by come by and they dance for yeah. a bit with it yeah. and, it's and important. people bring their kids and they you know it's yeah. a it's a nice thing so it, it it's it adds well you raise a really good point when you think of how truly how will any of us who care about the things we've been talking today and who are who have who are in the game, who want to make a change, uh, it would behoove us to look for how to make things fun. I, yeah. There's a, a national phenomenon right now called, uh, in the exercise world, I'm not a big exerciser, but there's a, 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 a exercise out there called Zumba, which is dancing, and their little motto is, uh, uh, 
uh, for, ditch the exercise, join the party. Uh -huh. and, and I think, uh, and it, it's really uh, a, a quite a um, commercial success as well, and uh -huh. it's getting people to move. So <laughs> for us to be able to figure out what are the, what's the, uh, the analog in yeah. our world of trying to yeah. do something. Well, it, this reminds me of, of when, in 1982, the, I worked with yeah. the Thurston, and you too, worked on the Thurston County Nuclear Weapons Freeze Campaign, and this is the time during Reagan's military buildup and this, the deployment of uh, crews and Pershing missiles, and just the, the, the world was just on the verge of blowing itself up, and we could have said, holy crap, we're gonna blow ourselves up, this is horrible. We were all, we were serious about it, but the slogan for the campaign was, ain't it great to be alive? Mm -hmm. And it just captured the kind of spirit we wanna have, which was a positive thing, and we won the vote in November of 1982, with like 63% of the vote countywide to have the United States, to call upon the United States government to stop the production and, and deployment of, of nuclear weapons. Well, this is great, yeah. but we, we did our efforts with that kind of spirit. Right, right. I was in Korea about five years ago and was involved in a couple of uh, protest movements and, and, and it was that way there. That every third person was waving a flag. There was music. Yes. There were people dancing around nice. all the way across Seoul. Mm -hmm. and it, it, it was such a striking difference to so many of our protests here that are fairly somber. Mm -hmm. that, you know, Olympia yeah. FORs is is unique in that sense. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. um, they sh more people should be copying what you're right. doing. When, when we were preparing for the program, you mentioned also the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers. Mm -hmm and they've been producing these wonderful short videos and these kids have such heart and such a positive attitude even though they're in the just the most horrible circumstance these in the are middle some of, of the Afghanistan most courageous kids they're, they're age 13 to, to 20 19 yeah. or 20 yeah. they're living in the middle of yeah. this great war and they're they're by their lives they're opposing the Taliban and the US uh -huh. Yeah, and they're calling upon people and calling to upon people to live practice peacefully. practice your best values. Uh, one of their things was, why not love? Why not love? Instead of looking at militarization and fighting, why not try practicing love as a way to solve the problem? This is coming from kids, yes. and the diplomats can't figure that out. But uh, they've been doing such wonderful stuff, and we've been kind of helping with them in some ways. Um, we're, we're doing a thing also of, of bring the billions mm -hmm. home camping, bring our billions home, and you and I are both on the steering right. committee of that project through the Western Washington Fellowship of Reconciliation, and the Olympia it, FOR is very much involved. Yeah, it's still, it's still somewhat developing, but the gist of it is to make people aware of the things that are not being done or aren't being, that were done but are not now being done in their communities basically because of lack of funds. Right. And I think what struck me was listening to the legislature trying to cut the state budget by $4 billion and the Washington state taxpayers are spending about $4 billion a year to support the war. So it isn't as wow. though we even need new money. Yeah. The money's already being spent. It's yeah. just, again, it's just the priority. Where's the money going? Yeah. It should be going to the things, yeah. you know, the, the Foster yeah. programs right. and the kids, the libraries, and yeah, all that yeah. Stuff I mean, that library hours cut. have been cut, and mass transit is cut. Right, we're already paying the stuff. money that should be supporting yeah. that. It's just going right, and a lot. You know, the state and local. I was talking with a mayor of a local community. I won't say which one. Just three days ago, and uh, mentioned this to that mayor, and that mayor really got it. I mean, mm -hmm. because state and local governments have been cut from a lot of federal funding they used to get. Um, I, I know there are some good websites available. I want to just put in a plug for people can find out about the Bring Our Billions Home campaign through the Western Washington FOR website, which is www.for.org. They can also do it through the Olympia FOR website, which is olympiafor.org, and then there's some more lettering that goes on beyond that. Um, you had earlier talked about this fresh approach to government is mm, good, yeah. and there's actually a website called governmentisgood.com. I've read a bunch <laughs> a of those concept. articles, and they're very good. Yeah. Doesn't mean everything government does is good, and, yeah. and that guy actually has an article on there that says 
the main problem we have with government is that it's not democratic enough, small d democratic. It's too much run by the special interests and for the benefit of the special interests. That's what we need to fix rather than right. slam exactly. government altogether. Exactly. And very smart articles on there. I recommend that. And uh, for people who want to talk with others, uh, the, the website publicconversations.org helps people carry on thoughtful, humane, respectful conversations about controversial issues yeah. at the local level face-to-face, -face, and I recommend that. Um, there's also information, good information about nonviolence and grassroots organizing to solve problems at the Olympia 4 website. You can visit olympiafor.org and then click on the nonviolence. It has a, a range of information there that's good. What would you like to see people do about the things that we've been discussing? I would like people to look at what is working um, in terms of what what some of the government services are that they're receiving to appreciate that. <laughs> it sounds so humble, doesn't it? And I would also like all of us to uh, practice saying, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm personally convinced that the U.S. Uh, military empire is going to collapse within the next 10 years the same way the Soviet empire collapsed. But if that happens, the United States will still be here. And if we look at the history of the United States, there have been people-led movements, the, the uh, union movements, the farmers, the, the women suffragettes, the civil rights movement. We have that potential in America to create a, a, a space for everyone to live. Mm -hmm. So I think people need to have hope they need to educate themselves about what's uh -huh. what's the potentials and what's going on. Okay. They need to they need to learn how to think about what they're told. Wow, good. Uh, can we get uh, another brief closing thought from each of you? We'll squeeze that in and then wrap this thing up. And don't say I don't know. I know I know you have a wealth of wisdom. <laughs> I will just say wisdom. thank you for organizing okay. this, and okay. thank you for people who are watching this and who yeah. are considering these ideas. Yeah, it'll be fun to anticipate what people may do as a result of this. And yeah, I think we need to develop the kind of community that Martin Luther King talked about, the beloved community, yes. in which we treat treat each other with respect. When we realize that there's no reason to think that you are any better or any worse than anyone else. Right. Well, I want to thank Larry Kirshner and Becky Liebman. I'm happy that we were able to get both of you on this program. I want to thank all the folks who've been watching. Um, on April 4th, 1967, Martin Luther King gave a, a powerful speech at Riverside Church in New York City, and he critiqued the Vietnam War, and he put it in the larger context of the Civil Rights Movement, which was being robbed of the money that was needed to solve issues of poverty because the money was going to the war. And he was connecting the dots. And some people were upset that he was connecting those dots. Um, but he, he had a pretty good critique of US foreign policy and what needed to get done. He said, I'm convinced that if we were to get on the right side of the world revolution, we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. When machines and computers Profit motives and property rights are considered more important than people. The giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. A true revolution of values will lay hand on the world order and say of war, this way of settling differences is not just. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. So I think we need to look at the rest of his speech. Uh, you can find it on the internet. And practice your best values and your best wisdom at the local level and help it reach out from there. So that would be an interesting way to proceed. See if we can get beyond this us versus them world because we really are all in this together. You can get information about a wide variety of issues that relate to peace, social justice, and nonviolence uh, from the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation at 4919093 or www.olympiafor.org. We're all one human family. We all share one planet. We can make the world a better place, but we all have to work at it. And the world needs you. Thanks.
and humanity. Are these things interconnected? Do they have common roots? Can we find solutions that will resolve these problems and restore our public ethics and our common humanity? How can we reduce fear and violence and build a society that is secure and nonviolent? During this hour, we will explore these problems and we'll explore positive solutions. I'm happy to welcome two guests who will share their insights and their recommendations. Both guests are people I've known and respected for a good number of years, and I've always enjoyed working with them. It's a real delight to have on the program Larry Kirshner and Becky Liebman. Welcome. Good to have you here. Thanks, Scott. Uh, they have rich backgrounds on a range of topics, and we will explore a range of topics and uh, reconnect and uh, meander through these things, and I think it'll be uh, interesting and, and fruitful. Let's start with uh, some aspect of privatization. Uh, the program, we want to explore the common good. It's in the title of this episode. That somehow business and through the market forces are better qualified to provide these kinds of services. But um, in, f in fact, I mean, we can show lots of incidences where that, in fact, is not true that the government-run um, programs are much more efficient. If you look at healthcare, Medicare and the VA system have an overhead uh, cost to run the programs of about 3%, whereas the private insurance companies in this country have an overhead in the neighborhood of 30%. And that 30% that overhead, were it being run through a government-sponsored um, program like Medicare for Everyone could cover the 50 million people in this country who aren't currently have no insurance and no extra cost. So there are plenty of incidences where we can show that collectively through our representative government we can do things more efficiently than the market because we don't require a profit. Mm -hmm. um, there's uh, an example that with the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation. This TV series explores a variety of issues that relate to peace, social justice, and nonviolent social change. In recent years, American society has experienced a serious upsurge of anti-government rhetoric, including threats of violence against members of Congress, and in January 2011, an actual shooting. We've seen a continuation of war, torture and human rights abuses, cutbacks in vital social and health services. We've seen a mania for privatizing public services. We've seen intolerance of minority races and religions and an overall breakdown in the sense of our common In recent years, we've sh seen a shift away from the common good to a mania for privatizing a lot of aspects of public life. Instead of improving and supporting public schools, some people want to take money away from 
public schools and fund private charter schools. We've seen some states that have privatized their prisons, so instead of having state employees do it, who are well-trained and adequately paid with decent health care and food, they privatize them, and then the companies that run those prisons cut food quality, cut <coughs> health care, and pay cheap wages to poorly trained uh, prison guards. Um, and even the U.S. military is contracting out some functions that U.S. troops have performed, and they've had organizations or corporations like Blackwater do them, even though they charge more than having the troops do it. But it's this mania that says, we've got to take money out of the, the, the government and fund private things instead. So I wonder, can you offer some insights into this mania for privatization uh, versus a commitment to the common good? It, it, a lot of it's based on the, the idea 